Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. What you will hear transcribed in the next half hour represents either a magnificent hoax or the true explanation of the famous Grimshaw Sanatorium scandal, which made the headlines back in 1947. The manuscript upon which this account is based was removed by the New York State Police from a fountain pen cover found in the doorway to Dr. Grimshaw's study. We offer this manuscript as evidence only. Whether it is authentic or not, you must judge for yourself. College, class of 34, member of Theta Alpha. I'm one of those fools who wanted some excitement in life. So instead of going into my father's shoe business, I became a private detective. These are facts. You can check them if you like. The rest of what I write here is so fantastic that I don't expect it to be believed. If anyone should find this manuscript and read it, all I ask is that you notify Miss Millicent Armbruster of 299 Wallace Avenue, Buffalo, that Johnny Doherty is dead. On the evening of July 1st, Miss Armbruster and I were driving to a wedding. Not our own, though I wish it had been. It was Sunday, and in order to avoid traffic, I took the old mill road, single-lane dirt affair that runs past the Gowanda Cemetery. Hey, Johnny, aren't you going too fast? Uh -huh, not for this road. There isn't a thing around except some tombstones. Johnny, there's a gate what? to the cemetery. What about That hurts. I don't see hey, any... Johnny, look out. Uh look out. Ah! It was a big black hearse with no lights on, pulling out of the cemetery. Lucky I had good brakes. We skidded for about 20 feet and slammed into the back of the hearse. The two rear doors buckled and snapped open. It was a freak. A huge oak coffin with brass handles tipped up and began slowly to slide back toward us. Oh, Johnny, look. The coffin is sliding out. Holy man. Oh, how horrible. You, you stay right here, honey. I, I'll help the driver with that thing. Hey, you okayed in the speed limits, do you, Jack? Now, look, let's not get hung up on who was right and who was wrong. I was going too fast, and you were traveling without lights after dark. Main thing is, nobody's hurt and no damage done, except for that coffin. And I don't suppose the occupant minds too much. Let's see the driver's license and registration. Right here. Hmm. John Doherty. Oh, a private eye, huh? You listen to the radio too much, Junior. Now, if you don't mind, who does this joy wagon belong to? Rwanda Funeral Service. It's being rented to Grimshaw. Who? Grimshaw, from the private sanatorium. Do you mind if I ask what you were doing after dark, coming out of a cemetery with a wooden kimono? We're moving one of Grimshaw's patients to a new grave. Uh-huh. Do they always travel like this? Now, look, Hawkshaw, how about skipping the third degree and giving me a hand getting the box back in the wagon, huh? A pleasure. Better screw on the cover again. It's going to slide off. Well, let's get it in the hearse first. Okay, Junior. You get on that end. Ready? Live. Just, just slide it, brother. Who's in there, King Kong? Look out for the cover. Hey. Uh, I told you that it happened. Hey, uh, uh, what's the guy's name, Junior? Why don't you ask him? Real wise guy, huh? I've got half a mind to report this accident. Yeah, go ahead. See what gets you. Grimshaw's got a lot of influence around here, mister. A lot of influence. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll deliver the body. So long, Junior. Johnny? Johnny? I'm coming, honey. Everything all right, Johnny? Well, I thought so until a few seconds ago. Uh, listen, baby, can you sit here in the car for another five minutes? 
Well, we're due at the wedding in half an hour. I won't be long. Where are you going? For a stroll through the cemetery. Oh, hey, Johnny, stop making jokes. Honey, when we lifted that coffin back on a meat wagon, I got a good look inside of it. Oh. Exactly how I felt. I figured we'd knock the stuffing out of the corpse. I mean, I didn't expect the stuffing to be sand. What? Yes. It wasn't a body. It was a dummy stuffed with sand, a dummy with a wax face. Johnny! Which brings up an interesting question. Who's supposed to be in that box? And uh, just where is the dead man spending his time? Sometimes in my business, when things drop off, you have to go out and uh, dig up new clients. Well, my next case was a gentleman named Harlan Ward Sr., the wealthy automobile manufacturer. I'd gotten his name off his son's tombstone. Are you trying to tell me, Dorothy, that my son Harlan was never buried at Kuanda Cemetery? Exactly, Mr. Ward. Why? Maybe if you'll tell me the circumstances surrounding your son's death, I can help answer that. My son was a rather impetuous young man. Tall, good-looking. After his graduation from Princeton, he began drinking quite heavily. After he got into a couple of scrapes, we sent him to Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium in the hope that he could be cured. While my wife and I were in Europe, we received word that he had died. He was buried at Gowanda in our absence. Last week, my wife and I decided to have his body removed to the family vault here at Short Hills. How did your son die, Mr. Ward? Suicide. He slashed his wrists at the sanatorium. You never saw the body? No. We couldn't get back from Europe in time. I see. See here. How do I know this whole thing isn't a plan to fleece me? How do I know that you didn't remove the body yourself? You don't. But you're a rich man, Mr. Ward, and you're perfectly willing to take a chance that I'm on the level and that your son may still be alive. You sound very sure of yourself, Mr. Dorothy. My fee is $2,000 retainer plus expenses. What sort of expenses? However much it costs to take the cure at Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium. What do you say, Mr. Ward? All right, Dorothy. My secretary will send you a check in the morning. Good. Oh, uh, one other thing. What's that? I want a photograph of your son, a good one. I think that can be arranged. Look here, Dorothy. If I cooperate, how do I know that you won't run off? I won't guarantee it. On the other hand, I might have to get myself killed on this job. We both take a risk, Mr. Ward. Dr. Grimshaw's sanatorium was just outside Gowanda, and it was strictly for the 400 at $60 a day. Most of the cases were nervous breakdowns and alcoholics. I committed myself as a dipso, and just to make it convincing, I stopped at five or six bars on the way over. I was interviewed by Grimshaw himself, a small man with a fringe of white hair. He seemed on the level. And yet, there was something just the slightest bit phony about the whole deal. You uh, understand, Mr. Doherty. Uh, that's not my real name, of course. Social reasons. Mm. We understand. Our paid clientele is very select. Our rates are rather high. You'll be paid in cash and in advance, Dr. Grimshaw. You will find us most sympathetic. Um, how long does a cure usually take, Doctor? Well, that, of course, depends on the degree of alcoholism. This is my assistant, Dr. Boy, now. How do you do? How do you do? We are accepting Mr. Doherty's patient. Better place him in the ward with Mr. K and Mr. Crakey. Mr. K is a long-term patient, Mr. Dorney, highly intelligent man, formerly a professor of plant pathology. Mr. Crakey suffers mild delusions. I think you'll find him rather amusing. After about three days, my roommates, Arthur K and Crakey, got used to me, and we even began to play three-handed bridge. K was a chronic dope addict, an intelligent, sensitive man. Crakey was nothing but a clown. He kept a big black cat named the Professor, which he talked to as if it were human. And so I said to her, my dear Countess, if you don't like the company of my cat, then you don't like me. She looked at me as if I were insane, but of course the joke was on her because I was <laughs> a Professor. Meow. 
You'll have to forgive Count Crakey, Mr. Doherty. When you've been here as long as I have, you'll get used to him. Do you like cats, Mr. Doherty? I do hope you like cats since we are to have adjoining rooms. The professor is very sociable and excellent company. Except when he kills birds and deposits them in your bed. He's nothing but a feline murderer, as far as I'm concerned. Ah, uh, see, you have insulted him. <laughs> Come here, Professor. Let's make friends. Uh, how about giving me your paw? Uh, hey, catch uh, me, you black devil. You insulted him. You hurt his feelings. Well, keep him away from me. It will be a pleasure. I would advise you not to insult him again. Count Crakey is not altogether without influence here, as Mr. Cable informed you. Good afternoon. It's evening. <laughs> Is he always as nuts as that? Ever since I've been here. How did they let him keep that black Satan? I don't know. I suppose Grimshaw wants to pamper him. He's been here since they opened the place, I understand. Spends about three hours a day getting therapy from Grimshaw. What's his problem? Manic depressive. A little paranoid, too. Mm. How long have you been here, Arthur? Grimshaw's two years. I left for a while, but I couldn't stay away from the junk, so I committed myself again. Did you uh, happen to know a patient here named Harlan Ward? Why do you ask that? Do you know him? Oh, I met, met him socially a few times. Uh, I understand he died here. So the newspapers said I wouldn't know. Suicide, wasn't it? Was it? You're being pretty careful, aren't you? Mr. Doherty, what would you say if I were to tell you that I don't believe Harlan Ward is dead? What makes you so certain? Harlan Ward used to share this room with us. He slept in the same bed you now use. I see. He was an alcoholic. Doing quite well, too, from what I could observe. We all expected him to go home soon. Then one evening, he had a violent fight with Crakey. Crakey accused him of snooping or something. Later that night, Grimshaw and Boyner took him out. Where? They take all the special treatment cases to the charity clinic. It's that small building on the other side of the stone wall. I think they do their surgery cases there. Why did they take him there? I don't know. Confinement, I guess. A few days later, we read about his death. Suicide, they said. Why do you think he's still alive, Arthur? This. About a month ago, I was in the garden next to the wall that separates us from the charity clinic. Suddenly, I thought I heard a sound like a child whimpering. It stopped. A moment later, this note came over the wall wrapped around a stone. Then I'm certain I heard a blow and a scream again like a child. What does the note say? Help me, for God's sake, Harlan Ward. I haven't told anyone yet for fear Grimshaw and Boynton might find out. It might just be some insane prank by one of the charity cases. And yet, but why should Dr. Grimshaw want to pretend Harlan Ward is dead? I'm not an oracle, Mr. Doherty. What about this charity clinic? I've always been curious. Grimshaw and Voyner make sure that no patient goes there unsupervised. Many of those who've been taken across like Harlan Ward, I've never seen again. Arthur, how'd you like to have some fun? Like what? Like sneaking out tonight and going over the wall. What do you say? It'd break the monotony a little. I don't know. If there's something fishy going on, it'd be better to find out now, wouldn't it? I suppose there's no real harm in it. Of course not. I I'd go alone, but I'll need help scaling that wall. Will you do it? All right. I'll go with you. It was shortly after midnight when Kay and I slipped out of the room and made our way out to the garden. Count Crakey was snoring soundly when we left. The wall was about eight feet high, but we made it without too much trouble. Hunt! All clear. Give me your hand and I'll lift you. Careful when you drop. Ready? Go ahead. There's a charity building over there. One of the lights in the basement window. Come on. We'll make a run across the driveway and hide in that clump of bushes alongside the building. Ready? All right. Okay, hold it. Drop flat. What's the matter? Let's crawl over toward the window with the light. Maybe we can see something. I suppose you've got to relax. Listen. Take it easy. Sounds like Grimshaw. Much Let's get closer. Can you make out what he's saying? No, I... 
Good Lord. What was that? Probably some patient having the DTs. I think it came from that basement window. Let's get over there where I can have a look. Easy. Yes, Wouldn't what? do to get caught now. Just... Take See anything? Easy and relax. It's some sort of nice. laboratory. That's right. I can see Grimshaw, Zoyna, and someone else Come with on. its back toward me. If we're still, we may make out what they're saying. Take it quietly. It will be easier. No. I warn you. Please, please. It will all be over soon. No. You won't remember anything. No, I don't want to go. Boyna, give it to him. No, no, no. Shut him up, Boyna. No. Good Lord. What is it? Come on. We've got to get out of here. What did you see? What did they do to that child? Arthur, that wasn't a child. It was a midget. The smallest midget I've ever seen. What were they doing? Trying to give it some sort of injection. When it resisted, Boyd and knocked it out. Well, what do you suppose they were doing to it? I don't know, Arthur. All I know is that when it fell, it had the face of Harlan Ward. <laughs> All the way back to our room, my brain was working like a pinball machine. Only the score wouldn't add up. The, the pieces were there, all right. A crazy old doctor, a brutal assistant, a private sanatorium, and a midget with a dead man's face. But I couldn't figure it out. I thought that when I got back to our room, I'd have some time to think about it. But I'd forgotten about our friend, the happiness boy, Count Craigie. Ah! So I have caught you! Fine. So you've caught us. Now, how about crawling back into the woodwork like a good little count? Well, where are you? Mink hunting. Arthur and I like to go mink hunting at night. It's a funny thing, though. The mink weren't running very good. The grunion were running like crazy, though, weren't they, Arthur? Like crazy, Mr. Doherty. You make fun of Count Crakey. You're lying. I shall report you to Dr. Boyna. Better not, if you know what's good for you. So you threaten me. Me, Count Crakey. World's champion gymnast and barbell balancer. I shall scream for help. Help! You heard him? Just knocked him out. What do we do now? Put him to bed. Hope that when he wakes up in the morning, he's forgotten the whole thing. And if he hasn't? They won't take him seriously anyway. I don't think Grimshaw would believe him. Besides which, he doesn't know what we actually were doing. Come on. Let's get him back into bed. <laughs> I went to sleep in my own room. And the next thing I felt was the sharp jab of the hypodermic needle in my left arm. I started to struggle, but it was no use. Take it. Boyna and another assistant were holding me down. Grimshaw stood over me, the empty needle still in his hand. That's <laughs> it. Be useless to struggle, Mr. Doherty. In a moment, your motor nerves will be completely paralyzed. What's this about, Grimshaw? I might ask the same of you. My good friend Count Crakey informs me... You and Mr. K decided to do some snooping earlier tonight. He followed you and saw you climb the wall. Crakey's insane. That is a matter of opinion, Mr. Doherty. Crakey, hey, what is this? Perhaps my assistant, Dr. Grimshaw, would be good enough to explain. Assistant? Yes. You see, I am the actual head of the Grimshaw Sanatorium. Grimshaw? Count Crakey feigns many delusions, Mr. Doherty, but in this case, he's telling the truth. Count Crakey is actually... Professor Ernst Hassler. Professor Hassler and I worked together in the Berlin Neurological Institute before the last war. Unfortunately, my political affiliations with the Third Reich were under investigation after the war by the War Crimes Commission. However, Dr. Grimshaw managed to smuggle me into this country where I masquerade as a mental patient. Thus, we are able to continue certain experiments which were interrupted by the American army. I can imagine the sort of experiments you've conducted. You and your friend, Mr. K, will discover their exact nature very shortly, Mr. Doherty. It's a magnificent opportunity to serve science. Then I passed out. And the next thing I knew, I was coming to in a different room. I guessed it was somewhere in the charity building because of the angle of the sun through the windows. They had me in a straitjacket and kept doping me until I lost count of time. I, I don't know how long it kept up. I remember one day being wheeled along a corridor into an operating room and hearing the voices of Boyner, Grimshaw, and Crakey as if from a great distance. Pituitrin. Pituitrin. Four cc's. Four cc's. How are the measurements? Reducing rapidly. 
We'll operate at once. Before I start the anesthesia. All right, Doctor. Commence. When I came to again, I had a blinding headache. And after that wore off a horrible sensation of weakness. I began to wonder if Craigie and Grimshaw weren't doing something to drive me insane because I lost all sense of perspective. The room seemed to grow in size. I don't know how much time passed, but one day Grimshaw came into the room with a bundle in his arms about the size of a newborn baby. The bundle was my friend Arthur K. Good morning, Mr. Doherty. I brought you a companion. I'm sure you two gentlemen will enjoy each other's company. Let me out of here. Let me out. I couldn't believe my eyes until Grimshaw sat Arthur down on the bed beside me. It was then that I got the real shock. For I realized that what had looked like a tiny bundle in Grimshaw's arms was actually the same size that I was. Then, for the first time, I began to understand what was happening to us. Arthur Kay and I were being made into midgets. We got the full explanation next morning when the eminent Professor Hassler, alias Count Crakey, came in to gloat over us. Uh, allow me to congratulate you, gentlemen. How are you feeling? You stinking monster! Oh, I'm disappointed, gentlemen. Do you not feel privileged to be a part of an experiment that will place me at the very top rank of the world's endocrinologists? What are you doing to us? It has been long established, gentlemen, that dwarfism and giantism result from injury to or malfunction of the pituitary and thyroid glands. The interlock between these glands was thought to be a hormone. I have discovered that this was incorrect. It is an enzyme, an enzyme I isolated some years ago. I was well on the way to synthesis in Germany when the surrender interrupted me. The interruption also limited the number and type of subjects on whom I could experiment. I was forced to find others. Such as Harlan Ward? Mr. Ward was only a control experiment. And now you've done the same to us. No, gentlemen. For you, I have reserved a special privilege. You, gentlemen, will be the first to test the full effects of the enzyme. In short, I intend that you, Mr. K, and you, Mr. Doherty, when the experiment is completed, will emerge as perfectly healthy, normal individuals. Except, of course, that you will be only five inches tall. The days and nights that followed were a living nightmare. A nightmare from which Arthur and I awoke for brief periods to find ourselves in a strange new world. A huge, frightening world where everything was enlarged a hundred times. When we finally emerged, we found ourselves imprisoned in a tiny mouse cage. Judging by the relative size of things, we could not have been more than five inches tall. Now that our senses cleared, we realized that the experiment was at an end. That from now on, it was either escape or be destroyed.
This is the record found in a fountain pen cover in the burned out hallway of Grimshaw Sanatorium. There is nothing to add except that the fire which destroyed the sanatorium and killed so many of its occupants, including Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Voina, was definitely of incendiary origin. It is believed by the fire chief that some small creature, either a mouse or possibly a cat, chewed the insulation off the wire and short-circuited the system. The two patients, John Doherty and Arthur Kay, vanished completely after the fire, and their remains were never found. Whether the manuscript which you have just heard is authentic, or whether it was the work of one of the more demented inmates of the sanatorium, we leave to your judgment. You have just heard another adventure into the unknown world of the future. The world of... Dimension X. Next week on Dimension X, and the moon be still as bright. The story of the first despoilers of the planet Mars the men from Earth. Tonight, Dimension X has transcribed Dr. Grimshaw's Sanatorium. Adapted for radio by George Lefferts from an original short story by Fletcher Pratt. Featured in the cast were Carl Weber as John Doherty and Roger DeCoven as Arthur Kay. Your narrator was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is directed by Edward King. Your National Guard is a strong, well-knit military organization of men from every state and territory in the nation. No matter what emergency faces our country, a National Guardsman has insured his future. He's trained to handle himself if the going gets tough, 
and at the same time, he's learned new skills to help his civilian career. Regular Army and Air Force pay scales apply to every hour of training a guardsman takes. So men, if you're over 17, join the National Guard. Keep your guard up. Enjoy Bob Hope and Groucho Marx, coming soon on NBC.